we've got an interesting uh, little panel session here today. Because uh, we, this should actually be a little bit controversial in, in uh, at, at certain points. Because uh, you, everyone's probably seen there's been some unlicensed locker services that have been launched recently, and we've got uh, the record industry and, and those who are doing unlicensed locker services on the same stage. So uh, I'd like to first of all uh, welcome our dear friend Sandy from Universal Music, who runs. Uh, Universal in this region. Thank you, Sandy. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we're going to invite Sammy from Google. And please, can we have a round uh, also for Simon, who uh, who's joined us from Beggars in London. And finally, uh, a big round of applause for Alex, who's just literally got off a flight from Europe and is going to try and stay awake from SoundCloud. <laughs> He's blogging as we go. Great, guys. So, I think if we just kick off with uh, Sandy first. Um, clearly, the music industry is going through some interesting times right now. Very We're sort of blessed. beginning to see the yeah. kind of, perhaps the end of the physical format is in sight. Well, why is the cloud so important? I mean, basically, it's the one trigger that's going to accelerate the decline of the CD. I mean, for the longest time, we felt that CD would have a slower path downwards, and a la carte and whatever would slowly kind of creep upwards. But with the cloud, what we're going to see is a whole bunch of subscription-based services or all-access services, and the CD will become more and more irrelevant. Well, why are consumers going to get excited about this stuff? Well, it's going to affect the way they live. I mean, rather than kind of like learning how to use a device and it becomes your default music service. The device will learn how you want to access your music. And you can kind of have music everywhere you go, following everywhere. you. I mean, the funny thing is, like, if you look at the, the progress of the music industry, cassettes came up because of the car. So you had a cassette player in the car, yep. and then you had a CD player because it was a better quality sound, and then you wanted lots of music, so you had your iPod or your USB stick that stuck into the car. But what would happen if all your music followed you everywhere, and not just the music, but your kind of playlists, exactly. the stuff you so, like. So imagine, imagine you had a device and you had a service and you listened to it on the MRT or subway, whatever you call it, or in your car, and you listened to this music, and wherever you stopped it when you got out of the car, walked into the house, turned on the TV or turned on the, the hi-fi, it would start for wherever exactly you stopped in the car. Right? Okay. So we've kind of got three types of service, haven't we? So we've got access services that just mean we've got access to everything as well as all my playlists and stuff, and it's all up in the cloud. We've got kind of license lockers, which work with you, where you kind of work out what's on a hard drive, and it sends the metadata up to the cloud, and you can access it everywhere, PC, TV, phone, car. And then there's also some sort of unlicensed lockers where you're uploading all the files up to the internet. What are the kind of pros and cons for each? I mean, wh wh what's going to work? I mean, it, it's early days that you see such clear distinction between the three different services. I mean, basically, I feel that over time, everybody's going to look at what's good in the other one and yeah. start to offer those services as part of the existing service. So over time, they're going to blur into this thing of what actually works for the consumer. Um, the good news about having all access is that basically it revolves around your life. Um, the locker-only services, I've got two concerns about that. I mean, the first thing is people have the locker services because they want to upload all the songs they've uploaded, uh, yeah. downloaded illegally for the last 10 years and stick it in a locker somewhere. Um, th that's one concern. Um, and the second part is that, you know, most of the locker services will be run by people who don't actually run the music business. So, I mean, to them, the only way to grow subscribers is to drop price. So you start off with a locker service that's worth 19.99, for example, and then a competitor will launch it at 15.99, and then the guy will launch it at 9.99, and then suddenly it's free. I mean, but the good thing about these services is that they can help users get out of piracy into a legitimate service. Yeah, and that's, and that's what we're seeing now. So with all the services that we're, we're launching, the first thing we're saying is, can you do this? Upload all the tracks that you've done in the past into a legalized service. And what happens is it, it identifies your track on your hard drive, but when it comes to play it on the legalized service, it will identify the same track, give you the highest quality sound on a legal track, you know, and make it available on your playlist. Um, as a result, all the illegal songs that people were downloading 10 years ago suddenly have a way of becoming legalized, and the people who had their songs stolen all yeah. those years ago will now start getting paid out of the monthly subscription. So it's an amazing 
development, and I think it's a, it's a very positive sign for the music industry. So, Sammy, you clearly like locker services, uh, and you've been, you were having a conversation with Universal and the other major rights owners for quite a long time about doing a deal to, to launch a locker service, but in the US, you seem to have launched something without any contracts in place. Yeah, What's well, it's no on? secret that um, you know, we've been talking to the industry for a long time, and by no means are we pointing any fingers at any companies or the industry as a whole. I'm, I'm sorry, we, I have to go. I'm we, <laughs> 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 we totally respect that licensors uh, have the right to set the terms for their licenses. Um, at, the, at the same time, we hope that everybody respects that Google can only do deals that make sense for Google and that provide a basis for a sustainable long-term business model. And so far, unfortunately, we haven't had a meeting of the minds on that issue. Uh, but for one, I am extremely confident that this is a starting point. This is not an ending point. And so you think you'll get there in the end? We continue to work with all the rights holders, and uh, you know we look to collaborate with them. So would you say that actually if you can come up with a deal that you'd actually be able to deliver a better service for your consumers? Well, there's no doubt that there are benefits um, from having licenses. You can, um, it provides for a deeper service. It provides for more um, uh, integration. Um, so there's no doubt that a licensed um, service is preferable. That's why we have been seeking these licenses for such a long time. We wouldn't have done that if there wouldn't be any benefit to it. And uh, as I said, hopefully in the end, we'll get there. So Sammy, listen, you used to work for Nokia where you successfully managed to negotiate lots of lovely licenses for the music industry and paid them rather a large amount of money over, over the years, I think. So why hasn't it kind of stuck this time? Why hasn't it worked out this time? Well, as I said, it is, it's a process. It didn't happen overnight at Nokia. Um, we've been at this uh, for a while at Google, and I think we're all, both the uh, industry and Google, we're all disappointed that it is taking that long. Uh, but it is very complex. Whenever you're talking about completely new business models, new innovative products, um, there's a lot of complexities, and, uh, and, and it sometimes takes much longer than you would want it to take. So would you say you think the music industry are being, perhaps they're looking for too much, or they're not agreeing on what the functionality is, or, or they want too high advances? What's the kind of sticking point? That well, I mean, if you're... If you're trying to get into deal, deal points here, you're not <laughs> going to succeed, but I appreciate the effort. Um, one of the things, obviously, with the industry is that there are many companies, there are many rights holders that need to be discussed, and there is a little bit of a tendency of everybody having their pet peeve, um, which does complicate things, because in isolation, uh, you may have a situation where it might be okay to agree to somebody's pet peeve, uh, but if you have to agree to everyone's pet peeves, then it becomes a uh, issue of the lowest common denominator that then just makes the uh, service um, either as a pro from a product standpoint uh, unattractive to consumers uh, or there are other business issues that, um, that make it impossible. Okay. So, Simon, how do you feel about Google having a music service up there at the moment? That well, I think both... Um Google and Amazon services, which have launched in the States, I mean, we believe that they need licensing. Um, so you say they're illegal? I, I didn't say that, but I say that they need licensing. I think there's, uh, there's, there's one point where everyone assumes that the music that people's uploading into these locker services is legally acquired and, yeah. and therefore have some rights to be streaming it back to yourself. But I think that's a really big assumption as there's undoubtedly a chunk of that which is coming from unlicensed sources. Um, it's really hard, if not impossible, to separate that out. So we're not saying you've got to filter what's legally yeah. acquired from not legally acquired. I think the answer is to, is to construct a license for the service which deals with all of those things. Um, so, so that's how we're preparing to look at it rather than saying, well, you know, you're infringing our rights and we're going to sue you. That's really not going to happen. But we want to have a constructive conversation with these companies about the value of our rights and about making their services far more attractive than they are now. So Sammy says he's had, a, he's had difficulties trying to get licenses, get a meeting of minds. I mean, as an independent player in the sector, do you think, do you think major labels make it too difficult? What do you think? Well, I think the problem seems to be in this circumstance is that the four major labels have four very different sets of demands. And from what I understand, Google's trying to shape a product around that. From my point of view, I want people to come to me with a really exciting product which consumers get really excited about, and then we work out how to license it. It seems like you know it's putting the cart before the horse. But clearly, other people have managed to get licenses sorted out. I mean, there's lots of access-based models. There's, there's a lot of growth in subscription services. 
Um, there's, you know, the Sony service, which you know where I'm involved in, where you know they have a cloud locker-based service that's licensed globally. Why, why, why do you, why, why, why do you think Google have had? It? Why do you think the majors have had an issue with sorting a deal out with our friend over here? Well, I mean, Google aren't the easiest of companies to work with, you know, at all. And I think that, you know, I think it's fair to say there's some history there as well. Sammy. Hi, Simon. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So, I mean, we'll, perhaps we won't comment on uh, how easy or difficult it is to work with Google. Um, but let, let's, let's talk about what's going on in Asia for a brief moment. So, wh why are you here in Asia? I mean, wh wh what are beggars doing here? Wh what do you see the, the, the future out in Asia? Well, I've been coming out here for about the last five or six years and just really trying to build up connections and trying to build up brand value for our labels and for our artists. I think it's, it's one of the areas in the world where there's real potential for growth here for our business yeah. but um, you know we're in a different place here than we are in Europe we're not so well established we're not so well known so we've got to well, be well, doing so the what sells work. out here well, what, what actually what, 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 what stuff that you bring out here actually sells um, is yeah. it important to like have live performances or yeah I mean I think for us um, getting bands into play I mean for the type of bands we work with live is absolutely core to what they do and I think for us to be able to bring out more of our bands, get them to play shows, get them in front of people is, is absolutely fundamental to us building a business out here. And, and, and it's a challenge to be able to get time in band schedules to come and do shows in territories where maybe they don't sell many records. Yeah. But that's the conversations that we're having. There's more local promoters here now, there's more venues, there's digital distribution. Yeah. So you know, all the pieces have fallen into place, but it's taking some time. And how, how many artists do you represent in total now, do you think? Uh, we've got about 100 active artists on our roster across four labels. So Alex, yeah. you've got four and a half million people who currently are creating music or sounds of one type or another who are use, uh, using your service to make it available on the cloud. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit, because I don't know how much people out here know. Yeah, sure. Tell us a little bit about what you do. So uh, maybe we can do a quick check. How many people know about SoundCloud? Oh, there you go. Cool. Um, Okay, so for, for the rest of you, what we're trying to do, we're trying to build um, services for people that create sound to allow them to share that across the web in many different ways. So if you're familiar with uh, photo sharing platforms like Flickr, uh, we're trying to do the same thing, but for any type of sound creator. So it's a platform really focused on the creator side. Um, and for us, it doesn't really matter if it's you know Paul McCartney, 50 Cent, uh, the Foo Fighters, or if it's somebody making something in their bedroom or even somebody just recording thoughts from their day and sharing that across the web. We believe that sound is a really key part of the web um, in the same way that text, photos, and images are. And so far, we feel that the, the web has been quite silent and we want to try and unmute it. Okay, so w one interesting question for you is if you're dealing with four and a half million people who are uploading stuff and yep. making it available, you must occasionally have issues with rights. I mean, how, 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 wh what kind of technology are you using to to try and prevent people uploading stuff. Yeah, I think I mean I think we've had a very different approach to that than than many other um, sites out there. I mean we started off quite small as um, more of a, a, a niche tool for um, for artists and labels within the pro semi pro music world. The aim was to build really really great tools for these people. Um, so we've came we've come from the inside of the industry and we've gotten a lot of awards and and um, Attention from people from within the industry So even from the beginning we had a community that was using it in the way that we intended it to yeah Then of course as things grow you have to put more and more measures in place So the the most recent thing that we've been doing is we've been working together with um, all of the, the, the major record labels also a lot of the indie record labels to build um, a, a sort of back-end system where you can do uh, automatic audio matching. So you're kind of doing fin fingerprint recognition, yeah, like the Grace Note technology, yeah, that's so you part can of kind of well. identify, oh, this is actually not owned by this guy. Yeah, exactly. And I think the key part about that is that it's, been, that it's also something that has been built together with multiple diff different stakeholders to make sure that we build a system that works as rights holders want it to work. Yeah. Because our main users are the people that create stuff, the people that are rights holders. So it's super central for us, it's core for us to make sure that the tools that we have work for rights holders, no matter if you want to share your track publicly across the entire web, on Facebook, on Twitter, everything, or if you want to be very restrictive about it. I mean, I think everyone track. would agree the services you offer are great for all of these people. 
and they deliver uh, the ability to promote very easily through the cloud. It's a classic example of the, of the cloud. But, yeah. but Simon, do you ever have issues? I mean, do you ever have to do takedown requests? Yeah, I mean, frequently. I think, you know, SoundCloud and the work that they're doing to try and protect rights is, is still a work in progress as far as we're concerned. But, but they're responsive, they're talking, they're trying to be responsible. But, but it's tough. It's, it's really hard. To this is the nature of the problem. technology industry, though, isn't it? Is that sure. the music industry, the technology industry, I think you were saying earlier, you have some contracts written on the back of a, on the back of a, some, a, a cigarette Literally box. on the back of a cigarette packet, yeah. Yeah. And then at the same time, you've got, I mean, Sandy over here, who may want to do great deals with Sammy, uh, but ultimately he's... He's trying to aggregate 20,000, 100,000 contracts. I think, I think we just had a very, very uh, clear lesson on how we need to be a bit more careful on how we approve a lot of the deals. I think um, what we've learned in the last 10 years is that we need to become faster on how we actually approve licenses and things like this. Um, the other thing that we've also learned is that we also can't be too fast um, because we've got a large number of legacy contracts which have very, very clear terms on what we can and cannot do. Um, so I think most of you are aware of the Eminem case where we've just been basically yeah. sued for millions of dollars because it's not in his contract to allow stuff to be licensed or, or music is licensed at a certain rate and the definition between is an iTunes service or is a Spotify service a license or part of a sale and the difference in royalties is probably triple. Right. Okay. Um, and as a result, by approving a, a deal which included that artist, we're suddenly you know, in the hole for a huge amount of money because lack of due diligence on our part, perhaps. Um, but it also kind of like hints back to why we do have pet peeves or pet issues on why we can't approve things quickly because we need to make sure when we sign up on the dotted line, we're covered. So Sammy, yeah. do, you think, do you think these guys act quickly enough? Do you think they understand technology and what it can bring them? Well, it is it is tough because I have I, I, I fully understand the complexities that the the, the labels deal deal with. Um, at the same time, you know, time passes, and uh, we do need to get licensing. It's not just the label side. Obviously, there's publishing as well. Yeah, extremely complex. If you think of services that the labels have supported, like Spotify they still haven't launched in many parts of the world because yeah. of publishing issues. So there's an overall issue with music licensing that needs to be reformed. There needs but to I think, be I think the good news is that we're, we're a much better place where we are now than where we were five years ago. And five years ago, we were much better place than we were 10 years ago. Correct, but we, so we can't wait for tens of years. We have to. Well, I mean, we're definitely in a better shape. There's so much more we can do to make this easier and more streamlined. I mean, I think there's a number of initiatives going on, things like global rights databases so you can work out who to pay. I mean, that's kind it's of quite handy, fundamental. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, these things should be in place, but there seems to be a lot of arguments about even simple principles of having a global rights database, who manages it, who inputs into it, who can access it. I mean, this is just, you know, c complete rubbish. We should be getting on with it. And I, I, I will add one thing that, you know, while I do appreciate what you, what you said about the complexities of the artist agreements, I think there has been, and I think this is changing also, there has been, the, the industry has operated from a position of fear rather than from a position of seizing opportunities. And I really hope that that will continue to be changing. Because you'd say, Sammy, you'd say, I've got all these Android devices, I can give you reach, I can give you new consumer. I mean, how many how many devices are you offering to help them get access to? Well, Android, as of uh, the fourth quarter of 2010, became the, 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 the largest mobile platform. We have over 100 million um, users right now. We activate about 400,000 uh, devices each day. Uh, the Android market is operating in over 130 countries, 200,000 apps, 4.5 billion downloads. So the reach is massive, and by definition, Android users are not iPhone users. So there really would seem to be a very substantial uh, volume and uh, reach opportunity that we truly hope the industry will uh, take advantage of. Okay. I mean, I mean for me, it, it really, I would agree with you. We've been in a position of fear because we've been losing our pants for the last 10 years. Um, and I think the, the most important thing for us is that as long as we can see success, then the level of confidence will grow. I mean, the problem is that in the last five years or even 10 years, all we see is other pe people making money off the back of the music industry, and we end up with peanuts. Um, so there is a need to kind of like put a balance back into the creative part of the business and, and to ensure that the content owners or content creators 
uh, rightly, what's the word for it? Compensated. Yeah. Compensated. And yeah. make a sustainable business for everyone. Exactly. You know, because at the end of the day, whether it was a telco business or something, or even in the case of Apple, I mean, like, you know, we all high five because Apple's now, what, 45% of the US market. But when we look at it on the whole size of Apple's business, we're like 5% of the total business, maybe 2% of the total business. So well, we're talking about cloud services today yeah. as a kind of magic bullet. Yeah. And uh, we've all sat here talking about magic bullets like Nokia comes with music before. Why didn't that, why didn't that magic bullet work? And what is it, what's about this new cloud scenario that's going to mean this stuff works? Well, I mean, I don't think we know yet. This is, this is just the first sort of incarnations are coming out of uh, cloud and locker services. You know, there's only a few with licenses and it's, you know, it's almost day one. We're back in the days of like 1999 when it comes to a la carte downloads. Yeah. We're just about starting to see this out. We're talking about tech here. And when we start talking about services and about delivering music to people rather than talking about the, either the legal restrictions or the technology components of it, I mean, no one's, you know, my mum, my auntie yeah. isn't going to get it, and we need to get it out into the mass market. So we need to talk about why uh, cloud-based services are good for you, the customer, what's the benefits for you, and how can you but access user music. experience is also really key, because, I mean, you, you've got four and a half million people using your stuff. That's a lot of people. Yeah. And that's user experience. If you use yep. your service, it just works. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all coming from... Day one, the first thing you think about is how does somebody experience this? Like, what, what does this product feel like? You know, how can they actually use it? And I feel like, I mean, you know, to be maybe a little bit, like, controversial in terms of what we're talking about here, but the whole idea, actually, of a music locker is a stupid idea. Like, well. that kind of product is silly. Like, you know, like, the thing is, why would you, like, want to have all of these files on your computer and then, like, upload them to a server to then be able to access them from there? I mean, we're already, you know, we're already using services where we have, um, f like, full streaming, right? And we can access all of that on our different different devices. So, you know, what's, what's the whole, why do we need this sort of middle ground of having to, if, if you try and explain it to somebody, like, why that makes sense to, like, duplicate it's, it's these files It's basically pay money yeah. to have access access to the stuff you already own or you've already stolen. Yeah, but yeah. the thing is, like, I don't care if I own it. I don't care about the, uh, well, I don't care about the files, right? Like, I mean, I, I just want to press play. I don't care if it's streaming from my computer or from somebody else's. So that's, I think that's the situation on a, on a high level. That's the situation where, you know, we're, n we're not necessarily thinking primarily about what the user experience around this is. Yeah. The user experience is, I want to take up this device, this device, and I want to press play. And, we, and we, we need it to be mass market, easy to use, great user experience. Yeah. I mean, if we look at, I mean, your old employer, Nokia, I don't know if you're allowed to, under your exit agreement, talk about this, <coughs> but, you know, it was a fairly shoddy user experience, wasn't it? Um, I think <laughs> there would probably be a relative consensus in that it could have been better. Whoa. Well, what do you what do you reckon, uh, Sandy? Well, it's not successful, so I think that's indicative. <laughs> do you think <laughs> user experience is key? How are we gonna how are we gonna make these cloud services actually take off? And 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 I'd also be interested. Yep. Do you think? I mean, do you would you agree that lockers are rubbish and access and discovery well, is the key? Well, I, I think the general idea of uploading all your files just to download them, uh, just to access them from anywhere is a very narrow opportunity for what we can do. I mean, what I'm more interested in is basically locker-based services which identify what you've put up there and basically give you a much more intuitive, easy, richer, richer experience. And for that, perhaps the consumer will be willing to pay something more. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the whole thing I was talking about, the way you know tech companies or telcos or whatever discount everything to a zero sum where your most profitable business ends up being a marketing cost. You know, by offering these innovative services that the consumers actually enjoy and it gives convenience and it's intuitive and it's blah, 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 they might be willing to pay for it because it's good. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I think, you know, you know, we're involved in the Sony service and one of the things about their locker service is it includes the idea of channels where you can discover new stuff because surely, I mean, Sammy, consumers are at least as interested in discovering new music they come to love as playing the music they've already stolen. Yeah, exactly. And I think when we talk about lockers, it's, uh, there can be many different types of lockers. So you'd like to do more yeah. than a pure locker? Of course. We want to have a rich experience for consumers that integrates um, different types of innovative uh, components. So the, the locker is a, is, is a starting point, and 
there is some usage or usability to the locker, so I don't fully agree that it doesn't make any sense. It does make some sense to know that you have the security of having your files in a safe place. You can't lose them. Um, there's the increased access to them. So there are, there are the consumer benefits from just the, the basic locker. It's concept. not mass market though, is it? Well, we'll have to see. As we said, we're sitting here. I think, I think it's a learning experience. I would trust professionals to, I think to start, seal off my files. For a start, not I think the idea of that having access to all your files anywhere you go is the start of the idea. Is that start the be all and end all of everything? I just think no, it's not. It's just no. a big So it, it isn't it actually like if? But but I think like we all uh, we all agree. Like we can already see like how how the products are going to work. You know, if we m fast forward a little bit, how consumers are going to listen to things, and you know they are going to be able to access you know, all of these 10, 15 million tracks on all of their devices. Like, we just need to, like, execute and get that done. I think, I think everybody kind of agrees on that's where it's heading. We need to figure out how we get there. But we're spending a lot of time thinking about, you know, how to get there when we're not looking at, you know, the other, like, really big stuff that's happening out there, which is that there's a lot more than just those 10, 15 um, million tracks these days. Like, we've in, in this middle of this massive shift where almost everybody is getting, like, engaged in creating and creating music and starting to share stuff that they've created themselves. And we're still thinking about, you know, the access to these 10, 15 million tracks. And I, I think we're not l looking enough at, you know, the really big shift that's happening out there where, like, everybody's getting involved in being creative and being able to, to create music. Okay, that's true. I mean, uh, just talking about creating music, I was, I would just wanted to ask Sandy, you were quoted in one of the Singapore papers yesterday as saying, the world's amazing, we're making more money than ever, revenues are up, profits are I, up. I was, I was had pr drunk from the night before. <laughs> 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 but listen, why is, it, why is it going so great though? Is it going so great? I mean, the fact is, I mean, we've basically figured out the idea is to monetize music <laughs> as opposed to monetizing a format. Right. Um, anybody who's willing to work with us, create a platform, whether, whether it's to build a brand, to create more exciting relationships with partners. Well, well, what are you doing differently in digital out here in Asia? It's not so much about digital, it's just about music. Okay. And we, we talk to a partner and say, well, what do you want to do with it? And then we just do whatever they want to do with us. Um, but I wanted to go back to something about what Alex was saying about the locker. I, mean, I agree with him that the locker is slightly stupid because, okay. I mean, I've, I've been a digital music guy for ten years, as, yep. as long as it's been around. I have seven copies of D-Lite Groove is in the Heart on my hard drive. I've got a one terabyte Did you buy hard them drive. all? I think I did one of them. <laughs> 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 but but you, you, you're off the point. No, I mean, <laughs> no, but, but what I'm trying to say is that, so I've got, I've got these like seven versions which I've basically acquired from basically transferring from six different PCs and buying two external hard drives and whatever this. And I know that five of the seven are crap copies which I acquired 10, 11 years ago. Um, and the thing which I find wonderful about the new cloud-based services is that the first thing is that it gives you a high-quality sound product. Yeah, it cleans guaranteed. It up. So whenever I look into my, my player folder, there isn't seven versions. Yeah. There's just the one. The metadata is cleaned up. The metadata is cleaned up. High quality a copy audio. the album cover. If I click it, there's information on the band, which I don't have if I just uploaded all my yeah. songs to a cloud, to cloud locker. Um, and I think that's the kind of change in accessibility, intuitiveness, desire for what I want to get out of the music that is starting to come in the new services that we're seeing. So that's where I agree with you that the locker service as a standalone is basically baby steps on where we actually want to take this. Yeah, but we're only there at the moment because yeah. that's what companies have been advised they can get away with with no licenses under US law. I mean, yeah. I mean uh, that's why we're there. It's not because yeah. it's a great service. Th and this is, we think this is US only, yeah? You're, you're only going to do this in the US, yeah? Well, we're not. We're not. Um, we're, we're working with the industry. We're, <laughs> we're trying to figure out a way to... Uh, <laughs> have a broad service. I have to say, you have to say, Sammy's a very brave man for coming here this week. And a uh, big round of applause for Sammy. <laughs> so, what, just what, like one, <coughs> one, one other thing. That you <coughs> there's so much, like, it's so, so complex, this, right? And, like, uh, we have a lot of smart people working extremely hard at it. And the recorded music industry is, what, it's like 9 billion now or something? And we still kind of define the music industry as that being the heart of it. At the same time, we have the music instruments markets, which is 18, 19 billion globally. Yeah. Yet that's not the music industry. No, no, no. Why aren't we opening the No, no, totally. Yeah. Now, listen, guys, because uh, I'm sure there's a few questions from this amazing panel we've got. And 
we've asked some questions, but I'm sure there's some even better ones. So I had one last statement I want to say to Alex, because from what I understand, SoundCloud is basically a cloud for all sound, not just music. Yep. So I'm going to be really, really worried when you have your top 20 on SoundCloud and fart noises and dogs barking is going to be higher than Lady Gaga and Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> or even BP's financial results. Yeah, well, BP's financial results, that's right. You know, or even this panel, which would be more concerning. <laughs> well, I've, been I've been recording it right now, actually. I'm up now. <laughs> so do we have any questions? Sorry, the gentleman over there. I think you have a microphone just coming. Hi, Sammy. Chris from the Business Times newspaper in Singapore. Will Google, Google Music Beta ever come to Singapore? I know you said in discussions, but... No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sandy. I know your perspective on that. S Sammy, uh, what's, what's your perspective? Will it ever come? What are the barriers? What will need to happen for it to come here? Thank you. Well, we're obviously a global company, so ideally we'd, we'd like to take our services as broadly as possible. Um, I think it goes... I, I think you know already my answer that, you know, we need to figure out all kinds of things with both the industry, uh, the recording side, the publishing side. Um, we need to look at the local legislation. We haven't done the analysis on Singapore. So we're obviously not announcing any plans uh, beyond what we're doing. I think one of the lessons that, that um, at least I learned from, uh, from my previous life is that you, you have to actually have everything ready before you talk about it. So we really don't want to talk about things that are not ready. Uh, to be announced, so I'm, I, I can't sit here and give you any dates, uh, but it goes without saying that as a global company, we want to take our services as broadly as possible. And I mean, and uh, Sandy, I mean, are there going to be other services coming here for sure? Access and local definitely, stuff. Definitely, definitely. They're on the way. Yeah, they're they're already on the horizon. I mean, there's several. I mean, am I allowed to name them? Yeah, okay, go for it. I mean, the the curiosity platform with Sony. Yeah. RDO, which is basically the ex-founders of Skype, um, Spotify. I mean, They're these, all these are all in on radar for Asia within the next 18, 24 months. I mean, well, perhaps after this panel session, you two need to have a sit down and see if you might be able to come up with a deal. Then, well, one of the great things about this industry to me has always been the fact that we can uh, we can duke it out, we can take the gloves off and have a ha have a day, and then uh, go for a beer afterwards. So it's a bit early for that right now, but uh, hopefully later. Okay. Super. Well, listen, guys, uh, let's uh, give them a big round of applause.